Well, our other um, very inspired leader, Lisa Herrick, <clears throat> is on a well-deserved vacation. And my name is Adele Dari, and so I am going to be greeting you today. And Lisa and I worked very closely together for the last 30 years. We're both psychologists. So it wasn't surprising that when she had this idea that I sort of jumped in right away. So I've been there. <clears throat> I've been with us right from the beginning. Right now, I'm calling from Boulder, Colorado, as I moved here at the beginning of COVID. And unexpectedly, I was able to continue on the leadership because um, we all went remote immediately. Um, and being part of this community has made my move here seamless. I mean, I really feel still um, part of a very, very active group. I feel like I'm in the best of both worlds. I have a constant view of the mountains and I also have all my activist energy together working with um, 31st Street. And it really, before, like all of you who are here now, I really got started in 2017 and I learned how to canvas and we put little tiny fundraisers together. And here we are with this huge organization with all of you with a higher number here today at this meeting, which is small than we, what we started with. And one of the things um, I'm very excited about moving into Arizona, and we also did some work in Montana because I'm now in the West learning about what some of the issues are. And of course, some of them are water, water, water rights, land rights, dynamics of the rural West. And that has been a big education for me to kind of fill out. And I sort of keep 31st Street abreast of some of that at times. And I've also shared our strategic grassroots approach with the people here in political groups in Boulder. And they really sort of turned on to that. And so um, 31st Street's name is on the streets of downtown Boulder. So today we're focusing on is Arizona and we're fortunate to have Eric Meyer, former minority leader of the Arizona House and co-founder of the Arizona Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, who will talk about what the stakes are in Arizona and up and down the ballot. Also, Kate Bassett and Jess Sass will talk about what Courier News is currently doing in Pennsylvania. Uh, people may remember we had a fundraiser for Courier um, earlier in the year. Um, Jim, if you want to talk a little, it's your turn. Yeah, okay. I hope people can hear me. I'm, I'm going to try not to hold this mic up next to my mouth. Maybe I'll try to... Can, can you hear me at all at this point? Yes. A little bit? Okay. Um, it sounds worse than it is. So, uh, But I am going to go ahead and jump to my uh, screen here. And um, just a few slides to get us going. And because uh, we have two guests um, who are going to have a lot of good stuff to tell us. So um, starting with what we just finished up basically on Wednesday, you know, we just finished up this great fundraiser for Wisconsin and um, uh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, we did pretty well in the previous fundraiser, so we actually increased our goal to $300,000. And, uh, you know, in re kind of record time, what do you suppose we raised? Well, over $330,000. So that's in about five weeks of time, guys. So this is what you did, not just you, but your networks that you reach out to. And I'll talk about a little some more about where this maybe is leading us. And of course, they're doing great work. Um, and you know, a hundred thousand dollars or seventy five thousand um, dollars, that's enough to make these folks, you know, you know, move the needle for them. So it 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 actually is significant. Now I did, you know, I I, I, I we put this in the last newsletter, but I I, I want to take a little bit of time just to. Um, kind of bring this all together as what the strategy is for us. And it's this federal trifecta, House, Senate, White House. And I think there's a way we're doing it where it's not too much and not too little. And there's a lot of synergy with what we're trying to do with doing infrastructure so that we can kind of try to do all of that because it's so much better for us to have you know, all three of those parts 
and you know do away with it, uh, suspend the filibuster, get voting rights uh, uh, in proper shape, and take it from there. So this is kind of another way of showing it. I've showed it various ways in some other fora, but you know we are not doing everything. We're you know uh, we're not. There are certain states we're not going after, but there are five key Biden states where we're doing our infrastructure. So we're either doing state party and or grassroots groups because we think that's the best way uh, to help uh, Biden and other statewide candidates because there's you know plenty of money for them going to them directly. But I've also added this um, column now on legislature because you know our plan is we're going to do legislature in these states and maybe one more uh, because legislature is so important in and of itself. And I know Eric agrees with that, um, but also because we really believe having strong candidates for legislature will help us uh, win those statewide races. And then the Senate, you know, we have these two key incumbents. They've got to have a huge amount of money, but they need a lot of help in their vulnerable states. So we're doing C3 and C4 groups in Ohio and Montana as well. So here's kind of like the plan or the scorecard, if you will. And lo and behold, we're about halfway done. So we started early. I mean, it's not really quite like that. And uh, you can sort of see the states we've done. And based on that previous uh, slide, you can see the only one we haven't done with only two we haven't done for infrastructure are Ohio and Arizona. So that's the next ones we're going to do. And then we're going to do the state legislature. So this is a very ambitious sort of schedule. We're going to do a fundraiser every month. And we've been worried, and I'm sure there is some amount of sort of donor fatigue and people maybe having fatigue reaching out to their friends for as co-hosts, because that's a lot of what drives this. But we, you know, we, we're still having momentum. So, you know, we know we're asking you to keep at this and to the extent that you can, we really appreciate that you will. Uh, you know, we will, we're gonna keep pressing on this. And um, just to look forward a little bit, when we do these state legislatures, I'm really looking forward to that because that those races are interesting. They are fun. You get these candidates that are really, you know, competent and enthusiastic and when you support them, you can actually make a really significant difference. So that's, uh, I'm looking forward for the last several months of this. And, oh, I just want to say the total funding to date is, you know, it's over 1.1 uh, 1 million. So um, it had, you know, we, you know, it hadn't stopped. So we're, you know, we're keeping our foot on the gas, as we say, until we run out of gas. You know, if we run out of gas, we'll, you know, back off. But until we do, we're just going to keep pushing ourselves. And uh, just now to talk a little bit about Arizona, I don't want to steal Eric's thunder. Uh, a little bit of repetition isn't bad at all. Arizona has everything. You know, it's got 11 electoral votes, key Senate race, two House races we can pick up, uh, both state, uh, Senate, and House, we're only one vote away from a tie, and we could do better than that. A Supreme Court race, a ballot initiative on um, uh, abortion. So that's a hard act to follow in a way. But Ohio, we really need that Senate seat. But also we have these other things, U.S. House, three Supreme Court races, ballot initiatives, notably one for fair uh, maps, which I think we're going to win uh, on uh, uh, on the ballot, and that'll make a big difference in Ohio if we can help them to do that. So, oh, I just also want to say that uh, one good thing about Arizona is there's a lot of what we call layering. <laughs> so, you know, there are voters in Arizona where their votes are going to make a big difference in a lot of these things. So there are uh, legislature districts that are within U.S. House districts 
that of course are within um, you know, the statewide districts. So there's a lot of opportunity there and strategy in Arizona. So I think, oh, no, I, I'm going to shift. So it's not all about fundraising. <laughs> These folks were actually out yesterday in the rain. Uh, some of our folks and some other people doing some canvassing, kind of getting toes in the water. We're grateful to them. So I just wanted to show one slide on where we are on voter outreach. And I have to say that in canvassing and voter registration, I would call it we're still in the exploration phase. We're trying out things. We have small groups doing certain things like events and so forth. And it's not really prime canvassing time yet, but we're trying to figure out the best way to go about those. Letter writing is gonna be very active with Working America uh, uh, beginning on June 19th, which is only a month away. So uh, John uh, uh, Medaglia and, uh, uh, is our lead on that, along with Roberta McInerney. And um, you know we put things in the newsletter about how to connect with them. Likewise, there is one big phoning priority, which is uh, Melanie Galloway heads up vote, what's called Vote Pro Pros in Pennsylvania, where they're trying to reach out to, or they are reaching out to inactive Democratic voters uh, and you know, getting them squared away, which is a great activity. I think very productive for people to consider. And maybe Melanie will put her email in the chat. I don't know. But anyway, that's my introduction. And I'm just going to turn this over to Eric. We already know what he has been in the past, but I'll say one other thing. He's a volunteer. So like us, he's a volunteer. He's doing this to save the world. So thank you, Eric. Over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, Eric Meyer, uh, former legislator and now volunteer. Uh, Katie Hobbs, who's our governor, and I, when I was the uh, leader in the House and she was the leader in the Senate, started the ADLCC, the Arizona Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee. And our website's just adlcc.com. So if I don't cover something, uh, you can go to the website. My phone number is there. You can call me anytime if you have questions. Um, at the time, Katie and I uh, were serving in a super minority. Uh, we have uh, nested 30 nested legislative uh, districts in Arizona uh, with one senator and two House members in each district. So we had nine of the 30 senators and 20 of the 60 uh, House members. We started the ADLCC, and since that time, we've picked up seats every election cycle to uh, Except for last election cycle, we had redistricting. It was a redistricting commission for us wasn't great, but um, we managed to hold on to our uh, 29 now seats in the House. So we're one shy of a tie in both chambers, 29 seats in the House uh, and 14 seats in, uh, in the Senate. Uh, for me, this is a uh, once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, we have the most Democrats serving in the Arizona legislature since 1965, and we have a Democratic governor. So if we're able to flip both chambers, uh, we um, can obviously make massive change in Arizona. Um, we have been under Republican rule essentially since uh, this, the 60s. We had to have had occasional Democratic governors, but never had control of the chambers where we could overturn all kinds of things uh, and make Arizona a better place for our kids and our families. Uh, nonetheless, we, we started the ADLCC. Um, it's not a typical caucus structure. So uh, it's outside, it's, you know, it's not controlled by the, the, the leader in the House or the Senate. It's controlled by a board of legislators and myself uh, as a volunteer. Uh, I'm the emeritus uh, board member. We are housed within uh, the Democratic Party, but a separate entity with our own board, our own bank account, and we make all our own decisions. And that's important uh, because you've probably seen where money gets spent on certain candidates and you're asked, why are we spending money on that candidate? Uh, we do not spend in primaries. Um, we only spend in the general election and our mission is to get to a majority. And we base our decisions on data, um, both uh, data at the door, fundraising by candidates, the number of doors candidates knocked, and polling. Uh, we provide all the services to our candidates here in Arizona. 
So we will be active in eight legislative districts this cycle, up from five last cycle. Um, we've slowly grown. I saw your $330,000 raised when Katie and I first started. Our total budget was $600,000 and we were active in three districts. We still picked up seats. Um, last cycle, we were active in five districts and won all of our house races and two of our five Senate races um, to put us in the position we are today to, to flip both chambers. Um, this cycle will be active in eight legislative districts and in those districts for our candidates, we provide uh, a campaign manager, um, field organizers, a finance person, as well as a communications person. Our chief uh, goal is to knock doors and turn out votes. And when we looked at the number, uh, you know, how important this is for Biden uh, and Ruben Gallego, who's our Senate candidate and our congressional candidates, um, we, our universe is much larger than say Joe Biden's universe because we, all these districts, except for one, this cycle that we're competing in are red districts. So we need to get all those low efficacy Democratic voters, independent voters, and some Republican voters to vote for our candidates in order to be successful um, in, in these races. So our ground game is our number one priority. We, uh, you just started knocking doors. We never stop. <laughs> we we um, will knock on a million doors this cycle. Um, some of those doors we go to multiple times. So we'll identify voters that are supporters of our candidates, say right now, but we make sure we go back to their door, remind them of our candidates. Um, and then we, when ballots drop, we are back at their doors. Uh, we also do phone banking. We also do digital. Um, we hire all the consultants for our candidates. So we hire, we do all the polling. Uh, we do legal we hire uh, mail, digital, and TV, where we do TV um, in some of our, our markets, it's uh, cost effective, but that's you know not our big focus of TV, but sometimes we do have funding mostly from outside the state's project or the DLCC to do that. So um, we are actively, um, you know, we recruited the candidates, we trained them, and we have data, and we know, uh, like you were talking, there's no up ticket, up ballot drop off. So last cycle, uh, we looked at pr precinct at the precinct level where we flipped uh, precincts from Ducey to Hobbs. Um, in, in those precincts, uh, our, in our five uh, districts we were active in, we flipped almost 40% of the precincts in the state of the 30. So, you know, uh, it, it, we really uh, turn out the vote and flip uh, voters to our candidates up ballot. Um, we also know because one of our candidates uh, resigned last cycle after the primary and after the ballots were printed, we had to go into a blue district and run our program. Um, and we uh, increased voter turnout in that blue district by 10% over the presidential. So in some of our districts, so I mean, that's amazing. Um, and we hadn't had that kind of data on our program before. It inspired us to hire a full-time person that has worked in every legislative district since the last election to build infrastructure. Um, and that includes, you know, how to how to cut a walk list, how to build a universe, how to canvas, how to register voters. And we have been doing that in all 30 legislative districts since last election. We are running Democrats in every single district because we know that when we have a legislative uh, candidate running, it turns out their neighbors, it turns out votes, and it helps up ballot. And um, I know you want me to talk about all, all the, <laughs> talking about the legislature, there's a lot to talk about, but let's talk about the overlap. Obviously, um, all 30 of our legislative districts, every voter we turn out uh, in those districts will be voting for Joe Biden or Ruben Gallego. Uh, Ruben's race, I mean, Biden's race here last uh, uh, four years ago, yeah, he won by uh, just about 20,000 votes. So it's close. Um, and, you know, you've probably read Latino voters, particularly Latino men, are um, potentially not voting for Biden this cycle. We have a particular consultant that all we're going to do is turn out the Latino vote. And our, one of our districts, our eight districts, the blue one is a Yuma district, which um, you know, voter turnout there is is um, terrible. We we have lots of room for improvement in every one of those votes, 
will help uptick it for both Ruben and for uh, President Biden. So, um, you know, both voter intimidation and apathy uh, prevent those voters from turning out. But we already have staff there working to increase turnout and build infrastructure. And we have, like I said, for the last year. Um, overlap with congressional races. Um, so, um, you know, Schweikert, who is our CD1, who we want to uh, replace, there's a eight-way primary on the Democratic side right now. Uh, it's unclear who will win that primary, uh, but it, we have overlap with two of our legislative districts, both Legislative District 2 and Legislative District 4, which are both very organized. They've been knocking doors. Um, our candidates are out canvassing this weekend, um, and and so are our volunteers. And most of our door knocks are done by volunteers. We have a, a huge uh, a complement of volunteers that help us achieve those goals. So the other um, is Kristen Ingle down in Pima County, and there's overlap there with a must win race for us in our legislative district 17. Um, which those the candidate on the Senate side and on the House side are uh, would get us to 30 uh, in the House and uh, um, 15 in the Senate. Um, I see that question and I will get to it. We do. The answer is yes. Um, the um, those and, and just so you know, Arizona, a tie. There's no tiebreaker. There's no lieutenant governor at this point. Uh, no vice president that comes in. So if it's a tie in the chambers, it means everything has to be negotiated. Um, and the great thing is we, at least for the next two years, have uh, a Democratic governor and Katie Hobbs serving uh, to uh, facilitate uh, those those kind of tiebreakers. Um, so 17, that's uh, Kristen Engel. She's uh, the other congressional pickup. Um, we have uh, candidates running in that district, and we have had a campaign manager there now for uh, almost three months. We have a field organizer there and a finance person already in that district. Um, ultimately, we will have 60 employees. The vast majority of those employees are focused on turnout um, and uh, and our, our uh, field organizers. And by the middle of uh, next month, we'll be over, we'll have 30 to 40 employees in the field already, um, which is you know, way ahead of what's called our coordinated campaign in Arizona, way ahead of the Biden campaign, and and definitely way ahead of Ruben and the congressional candidates who we don't even know who's uh, going to be uh, our candidates in those districts. So we use data to make our decisions. We'll start polling um, here as soon as legislative session ends, which we hope will happen in the next two to four weeks. Uh, we'll do a battleground poll first. Um, and then uh, we will do a um, uh, district district polling uh, to figure out where our best opportunities are for picking up seats uh, in this cycle. Um, we have multiple paths to victory on the House side. Uh, on the Senate side, it's a little tighter. We have to um, hold on to the seats that we have and, and pick up two more in District 17 and uh, District 2 to, to get to the majority there. Um, but we have great candidates in both of those districts and the Republicans have terrible candidates and are disorganized in our state. Um, we're out funding rate out fundraising them significantly. They have no infrastructure at this point out in the field. Um, so we're way ahead of them. Um, and we got some of their candidates thrown off the ballot because they hadn't um, done a good job of collecting their signatures even. So we're in a we're in a, a really good spot considering we were in the super minority um, just four cycles ago. Um, and have the opportunity to flip both chambers and what was a really red state just less than 10 years ago, eight years ago. So I'll stop rambling. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, there was a question about coordination. Absolutely. Um, our executive director meets on a weekly basis. Um, and so do I. And I'm in some of those meetings. So we coordinate with the governor's uh, campaign person, with the state's project, with the DLCC every week. Um, with our consultants every week and with <clears throat> the table uh, every week. Um, and one of the reasons uh, we structured our organization this way was exactly that. There was such a lack of coordination. I hated when I was out canvassing 
and would come to a door and someone had just been there um, or someone had just sent a, send a mailer on the same day. So they'd get five mailers about me one week and no mailers about me the next week. So as much as we can, because there are campaign finance laws that we, we cannot um, violate, obviously, we coordinate. And most of the organizations are staying on our side of the wall this cycle um, and doing their spending. Um, and we coordinate on, on the polling. We have a consortium that uh, the polling goes into and that's shared with everybody. So everybody can be on the same page about which candidates have the best opportunity of winning. Um, other questions, I guess, that I, yes. I really went quickly. Yes. Uh, hi, Eric. I am <clears throat> Aaron Hamburger. I am the membership uh, person at 31st Street Swing Left, and I am also the official question curator. Uh, so I've been collecting these questions that have appeared in the chat, and I'm going to now lob them your way so that you can uh, answer them for us. I know you've already addressed a couple of them. Thank you. Um, so we have a few different questions about various issues. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just kind of combine, I, well, let, let's start with the first couple hot button issues, um, abortion and Gaza, Israel, how is that playing in Arizona? Yeah, well, abortion obviously is playing in our favor. Uh, we have an initiative on the ballot. Uh, they've already collected enough signatures to get that on the ballot. Um, they, and they're still collecting. I think you probably all saw in the news that we're, we're back under a, you know, pre-Civil War era uh, territorial abortion law, uh, which made everything illegal in Arizona. Uh, the Supreme Court was the one that made that ruling. Um, and one of your uh, talking points was about getting rid of some of our Supreme Court justices, two of them. Uh, Clint Bullock is going to be um, retiring, it looks like. He doesn't want to take the heat for his vote on that. Uh, the other woman, there will be an effort. It's unclear who's going to lead that in Arizona. But the bottom line is that'll help turn out voters and in particular young women voters. Um, and they vote uh, our way, uh, at least last cycle, they voted our way 80% of the time, um, which was huge. Um, uh, some of our candidates only win by a few hundred votes. When I was running, I was my race was never called on election day. Um, it always took two or three weeks for me to be uh, called the winner. So on abortion, absolutely. Um, Gaza's a little tougher. Um, you know, people are all over the place um, and young people in particular. So I think our messaging right and our caucus is our caucus at the Capitol is actually split. We have some members of Palestinian descent and some members who are Jewish. Um, so it's been uh, a challenge uh, within the caucus itself. Uh, and then the Republicans, since they're in control, have been pushing issues that uh, put our members in a bad spot, um, having to vote on, um, you know, resolutions and things like that. So okay. my, my my hope is that, uh, you know, we'll have a better sense from our polling on how, young, how to respond to young people. Um, and and what we do know is that it you know when you look at abortion it, it's up there at the top the war in gaza isn't so highly ranked it's not a lot of people's first issues it's jobs you know inflation still um and abortion um so and housing costs in arizona like across the country but it's a big challenge here with the number of jobs we're creating President Biden has been great with the Jobs Act. We've got all these semiconductor facilities coming in, but it's bringing in higher paying jobs and forcing the housing prices even higher with the limited supply. So, Great. No, that's a wonderful overview. Uh, now, Eric, I just want to put you on pause for a second because our next speaker, um, Kate Bassett, uh, Kate, you were scheduled to um, come on at four uh, in about uh, 10 minutes but I understand that you need to get to the airport. Is that the case? You would like, okay. So Eric, if I can put you on pause, we're gonna bring Kate on very quickly to ask her, to give her presentation. And then Eric, I'm gonna come back to you because I have a whole bunch of questions that people want the answers to. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll come right back to you. So um, Kate, I'm gonna transfer over to you, totally shifting gears. Uh, Kate has been involved in our courier uh, media uh, initiative. So Kate, 
Take it away. Um, thank you all. And thank you for your flexibility. I apologize. I am uh, in the car in a McDonald's parking lot on my way to the airport. I need to uh, take a flight to DC tonight. So um, I, I, this is also quite perfect timing because um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Courier, we are are like the fastest uh, growing local news network left leaning in the country. We are in 11 states, including Arizona, and we are huge fans of the ADLCC um, and work very, very closely with them with our uh, news news organization there, Copper Courier. So can't say enough about the um, smart work that you all are doing uh, in Arizona, Eric, and we take a lot of lead from um, the data-driven approach to issues and candidates that you you take there. Um, so thanks for that. Now I'll jump in um, because uh, the members of 31st Street Swing Left have been so incredibly generous uh, for Courier uh, at the end of 2023 and the beginning of 2024 raising money to support our content organizing program, specifically in Pennsylvania. So this is just a very quick update. Um, if I if I have time for questions, I will take them. If not, you can always send them um, in the chat. Someone will compile them. I promise I'll get back to you. But I'm going to go ahead and, Jim, do you want me to share my screen? I think I can do that. I believe I'm, oh, look at that. OK, thanks, Jim. Perfect. Okay, so a little bit of background here. Content organizing, for those of you who don't know, is, is the unique practice of sort of blending best practices of field organizing and community development that's more familiar to the nonprofit world um, to really accelerate the roots that have been built in our state newsrooms, particularly this year in Pennsylvania with your support. Um, and, and our organizing team really works closely on a whole bunch of collaborative efforts in the state. I'm super excited to tell you about them, but what I will say is if you can picture a person in our five, so our Pennsylvania newsroom has five staff members for our um, content creators and reporters that work on our social first reporting. Um, all of Courier's sites in all of our states, are, our newsrooms are built to be social media first. So folks who are never paying paywalls, who are not necessarily paying attention to the news otherwise, and who most often get their information on social media. So we have four reporters doing that deep work in Pennsylvania. Our fifth staff member in Pennsylvania is a content organizer. Um, we were able to hire Jess Sass. She really wanted to be here today, um, but couldn't. She hopes to come to a, a meeting in the near future to meet all of you and say thank you. But Jess is on the ground working with all of the nonprofit and mission aligned organizations to make sure that we are amplifying content um, and the voices that need to be heard that resonate most with Pennsylvanians. She's working with influencers to make sure that we are creating opportunities for our content to be spread much farther than usual. And she is helping build infrastructure, essential infrastructure in the state that creates those surround sound narrative opportunities, leveraging uh, high quality news as the sort of source for all of this. So we can jump right in, Jim. If you want to go to the next slide, this is just a very brief overview about the Keystone, which is our Pennsylvania newsroom. It is our largest newsroom, um, I would say, in part because of 31st Street's uh, engagement. Um, we have already in 2024, our content organizing team has been responsible for nearly 4,000 new subscribers, which is huge and really exciting. Um, and because we have content organizing support, which really becomes kind of the backbone of making sure that our information gets to the uh, readers and voters who need it in our states, um, we also on our acquisition side did a big acquisition play in, in Pennsylvania to make sure that we were bringing in the email subscribers that we needed to build trust with, to make connections with. And as you can see, we have a 42% open rate, which is enormous. I think industry standard is is, you know, 20 at best. So these are folks who have come to us for their news, their information. We have a 10% engagement rate there, which is also enormous because that means people are talking to the content that exists there, which is really, really great. Um, that picture there is Sean. He is our um, he's our political reporter. I was just at Senator Casey's office um, when I was in DC last week, and he said, 
I think you guys need to get that guy a car because he is everywhere. He said, yes, he is everywhere. That is the kind of content that we are building and creating for the ecosystem in Pennsylvania, though. We really are everywhere. And a big part of that being everywhere is also the work that Jess is now doing. So we can go to the next slide, Jim. Okay, so in addition to the cool part of content organizing, which feels probably more familiar to any of us who have been involved in sort of grassroots organizing, volunteering, canvassing, which is the spread of information, we are also central in, in our program um, to really testing and learning to figure out what content is working best, what's resonating with people, how to share that with the ecosystem of other people that are creating content. And so part of what 31st Street's investment has been able to do is really allow us to ramp up testing in Q1 of 2024. So we did a ton of headline tests. This is a great example of just the different kinds of we would put our headline with some placebo headlines and really test and play with the nuance of how we tell our story. Because what we know about social media audiences is that oftentimes the headline maybe all they read. So we want to make sure we get the most important information up front and we get the information that is most likely to move voters by the, the good quality that we have. So because of that, we've been able to really use the winning jobs narrative, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. If you're not, make sure you email me after and I will give you some, some good intel on it. Those folks are doing really great work. So we were able to use the winning jobs narrative, do a ton of headline testing, share that out with other people in Pennsylvania who are building content around, especially around the economy, which is a really, really salient issue in Pennsylvania with working families. And we've been able to see an increase in the kind of content that we know moves the needle, that we know drives people towards civic engagement, not just at Courier, but in other organizations, C3s and C4s as well. And we can go to the next slide. So another cool thing we're doing, it's totally okay, by the way, if none of you really get these memes and GIFs, I also do not really get the benefit of these memes and gifts. However, I will tell you, there is a ton of data to back up the fact that people, particularly people who are less engaged in the political ecosystem, are sometimes more driven by content like what you see on the screen than they are by any headlines, by any factual information. And so we really want to make sure our content organizing program is helping test and learn um, how to give entry points to people. And we're doing that through some really creative collaborations. So there's a very cool organization called Into Action Lab. And Into Action works with uh, artists, I guess we can call them artists of today's digital age that create uh, this kind of social content and then they seed it in really unique places like reddit and they start conversations with that and when they're doing that they're also linking our actual article and we have seen click-through rates increase by almost eight percent on on the the content that has a gif or a meme and then an article created with it so we are testing and learning in pennsylvania particularly in a way actually and i just want to pause and say this because it's so exciting and you all are a part of it we have started to create notice in the ecosystem because we're building this infrastructure that really is able to develop that surround sound um, i think we all know and have seen on the right that extremists have leveraged you know lies most often that spread like wildfire because a conspiracy bubbles up on Reddit and you know within 48 hours it's on Fox News. Um, and then people like Charlie Kirk and Joe Rogan and all of these others in the cultural sphere are also sharing it. And that's that's how um that's how sort of culture wars things like groomers, things like book bans, all of these things take place. So we've been really thinking about how do we combat this, but not the same way? How do we fight fire with water? How do we use good, factual, honest information and make sure that people are seeing it in all the different spaces of their lives? So we've been really doing this uh, in Pennsylvania for the last um, four, five months now, gosh, it's May, five months, we've been meeting um, twice a week, 
to work on both the organizing side. So a table of digital organizers has come together to talk about how to seed the content, how to move the content, how to leverage content in traditional field campaigns. And then also uh, on the narrative building side, really looking at what are the stories that Keystone is telling? What are we seeing resonate? And then making sure that we're sharing that information with the people who are creating content so that we can see everything from digital advertising to additional um, traditional media outlets to the sort of grassroots content that's being built uh, all sort of tell the same story. Um, so that's a really exciting thing. And then we can go to the next slide. And as we are testing and learning again, you know, our testing phase will really come to an end at the end of Q2. Um, we are rapidly scaling. We will figure out what works and what doesn't. And then we will dig in on all of the tactics that we know work best. One of the things that we know uh, is going to be essential in Pennsylvania and every state in the country is really reaching and connecting with Gen Z. What we also know is that traditional tactics don't work with Gen Z and that they are getting a ton of information um, on TikTok. So one of the ways we are trying to reach the people who are not necessarily politically engaged and not necessarily actively seeking political information is to build out a, a new channel called That's a Thing. And these are all Pennsylvania-based influencers that come on and and do like a ton of content around basic adulting is kind of the best way to say it. Things like how to save your, you know, money in a 401k, things like how to get birth control for free, things like how does the stock market work. And as we're building an audience there, we're weaving in narratives that help people understand the connection between policy, policymaker, and your vote. And as we get into Q3, more and more of that content will be about civic education and engagement engagement if it takes off in the way that we're hoping it does. Uh, and Jess, our, our hire, thanks to all of you, will be running this program. I'm very excited about that because Jess comes from an organization called Gutsy Media. Gutsy Media worked with Alana Glazer on in 2022 around voting checklist content that did incredibly well. She has worked with influencers for almost three years now. So she has a deep bench of understanding on TikTok, what works well, how to build connection, how to make sure these influencers are promoting this content on their own owned platforms. So we're really excited to see what happens now that Jess has taken the reins. And we can go to the next slide. Okay, and then the other thing that I mentioned early on is that we are going to continue expanding our influencer network. So we have about five people who are um, consistently on a weekly basis, uploading content based on the Keystones um, stories. And what this really looks like is them taking our news. Sometimes it will look like a green screen background. Sometimes the link will just be in the bio and they will talk about the top lines of a key article that we know is salient and that we know may move the needle on a local level. So these are just some of the influencers that we work really closely with. Some of them are overtly political. Some of them are fashion. Some of them are food and travel. Some of them are just like we have a mom who just likes to talk about, you know, everyday Pennsylvanian things. Um, and, and what we have found with this influencer network, this is kind of a thing that across the board, um, you might have seen that like the Biden campaign has been having influencers routinely to the White House. People are talking about and understanding that trusted messengers are some of the most important people that we can bring into this election cycle. And so we are able to build this conversation. Can you all hear me? Okay, I apologize. Um, I think my computer computer got too hot in the car and just completely shut down on me. Okay. Um, I think I was just about through, Jim. I'm not sure if there was one more slide. No. Um, okay. We're good. Okay. All right. Good so place. just, you know, I really just wanted to say thank you to all of you for the investment that you've made in this innovation. Because of it, we actually have been asked to put proposals together um, for every battleground state to create this kind of collaboration and surround sound building. And I think it's really, really exciting because it may mean just increasingly strong infrastructure in all of the states that not just for 2024, but for the future that we need um, to make happen. And we would not have been able to do that without 31st Street support. Wonderful. We're so glad. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for all the fine work that you are doing. Uh, and uh, there's, do you know anything about or work with an organization called Accelerate Change? Is that something? We I do. Yes. I was just with Peter Murray uh, all week in DC last week. We work closely with Accelerate Change. Um, you will actually see Courier National, which is um, our, our sort of more progressive news arm that really works to amplify the work happening in the states but does so in a in a more sort of progressive um the kind of content you know all of us on this call would would mostly consume works very closely with now this impact so actually about 30 percent of now this impacts content is coming from courier in collab posts now on their social content and then we also work very very closely with parents together um which does incredible job of store of sourcing um storytellers in our states and actually that's one of the really great things that content organizers do so content organizers work with all of the organizers in places like accelerate with their um story banks um cap you know center for american progress uh the winning jobs narrative team to make sure that we're bringing those humanized localized stories to pennsylvania because we also know that more than anything else that's what moves the needle great well, we are going to allow you to continue your way to the airport because I know you're doing great stuff. But thank you so much for uh, chiming in and good luck. We'll keep tabs thank on you. Thank you so much, all. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, now we're going to do a kind of mental woo -woo -woo, shifting back to Arizona with our other highly esteemed guest speaker, Eric Meyer. Uh, so Eric was recently talking about hot button issues, uh, and I'm just going to throw one more hot button issue your way, which is immigration and the southern uh, border crisis. And also maybe if you can also talk about, is there a single most important issue uh, in on Arizona voters' minds? Is it cost of living, inflation? Um, is it immigration? Um, so maybe you can talk about immigration and then let us know what is the, the top issue for Arizona. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the governor's staked out a moderate position on immigration. I mean, Arizona relies on immigrant workers. Our agricultural industry here is a 20, over $20 billion industry. And you know all the lettuce that goes to the whole country during the winter time comes from Arizona and that all needs to be picked by people in general. Um, water um, is obviously a huge issue here. Uh, you know, the Colorado River Compact, we're in the lower three states um, and we're the first to lose our water. Um, again, Joe Biden was great in, in putting money into the uh, into a, the Jobs Act, I think it was, I can't remember which bill it was, but uh, that allowed us to buy additional water, um, but that will run out. The governor has been really proactive about um, cutting back on people overbuilding when they don't have real water rights. Um, and she took some heat for that, but I think it was really important. Um, but immigration, uh, you know, the housing industry is a big <clears throat> uh, industry here as well. Excuse me. I have a little bit of a laryngitis myself. Oh no. Um so um um we you know we need we we just don't have enough workers to build all the housing that is needed here in Arizona. So um it, it it's you know we want it's a federal issue needs to be resolved but it needs to be resolved in a sensible way. And I think there was a plan but the Republicans didn't let that be voted on at the federal level. Right. Other so ranking them, jobs, inflation, then comes education, cost. Uh, we have a huge voucher program now here in Arizona that's uh, sucking almost a billion dollars out of our, our budget, going to people who were already paying for that um, out of their own pockets at private schools. So it's been a wealth transfer to the, the wealthy people in the state who could afford to pay those tuition fees. Our schools are... Um, and I was on a school board for eight years or, you know, or 49th or 48th and per, per people funding. So education, water, guns is, a, is another issue. Um, we've 
when I say we Democrats have introduced all kinds of legislation to close the gun show loophole, to limit, you know, assault rifles, to limit uh, uh, cartridge and uh, clip size. All of those have never gotten a hearing uh, with the Republican legislature. So um, and then abortion is is moved way up there. Yeah, it's in the top three to five right now. Great. OK, I have a couple more questions. We do close our meeting at five. <clears throat> Uh, we like to be on time at 31st Street, so uh, but we will be um, sticking around for another, you know, 15 minutes or so afterward. Um, so if people want to uh, stick around and ask more questions, that's a good opportunity. Um, how do you assess the Senate race? Uh, is Gallego's ground game better than Lake's? It sounds like you were alluding to the fact that it, it might be. Yeah, I think everything Ruben's doing is better than than Carrie Lake's. And, you know, Ruben has been... A, a really good fundraiser. He's already purchased, for instance, I think $20 million in TV time. When Ruben announced that, uh, Carrie Lake announced she's going to buy $12 million, but she doesn't have the money. So it's nice for her to announce. Um, as far as the ground game goes, we're part of that effort. So, you know, we're now uh, basically almost a third of the legislative districts. Um, and then the state party will take over the other. Um, two thirds um, and they're ramping up as well. We work with them in coordination again, almost every day. Um, <clears throat> we have a full-time field person. I don't know if Ruben does right now or not, but um, you know, it's very clear to everyone that we need to turn out votes for not only Ruben, but for, for Biden uh, in all these districts. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Last uh, question. And by the way, um, just for all of our members, Jim popped a great reminder in the chat that we do have our picnic coming up June 8th. Uh, so a great way to connect in person for all of us. Uh, but uh, Eric, back to you. Uh, speaking of uh, outreach to voters, uh, we had a couple of questions about outreach to indigenous population mm -hmm. and then also um, the Latino population. And the question is, um, why do, do you think so many Latino men support Trump and how can this be changed? So maybe you want to talk about those two populations. Yep. Uh, uh, the state party has an indigenous coordinator. So does the governor's office. Um, and we, um, you know, reaching out to uh, tribal members is uh, more challenging um, and getting them to vote sometimes because a lot of them have P.O. boxes and the Republicans try to eliminate using P.O. box uh, to mail to a mail a mail in ballot to and to return it from. Um, but in uh, legislative district 23, which is Yuma, the Tohono Odom Nation is uh, a big, big part of that uh, district. Um, and, you know, their turnout is uh, less than we'd like. So we have someone working uh, there. Um, you know, in the northern part of the state, um, the way redistricting worked is uh, the Navajo Nation is basically one big district. Now, um, it used to be kind of tied into Flagstaff, which is in northern Arizona, but it's almost all tribal, you know, and and our legislative members that represent those districts uh, are tribal members um, and come to we have a weekly board meeting. They come to the, uh, and give us, you know, and if we have questions about <clears throat> voter turnout, voter turnout on on tribal lands is uh, different. Um, you know, there's a lot of events you have to go to and things like that. Um, to improve voter turnout uh, on, on tribal lands. As far as uh, Latino men, unfortunately, moving towards Trump, um, I think it's multifactorial. I think there's this perception that he will be better on business, um, which is not true. Um, I think there's also, you know, the strong man kind of concept. Um, they like, a, quote unquote, strong leader. Um, and I think we need to dis dissuade uh, those myths or those lies that are being spread within the Latino community. Um, I mean, the great thing is, you know, um, in Ruben's old district, um, our former, you know, uh, the the woman, there's a primary there between Yasmin Ansari and Raquel Tehran, but Raquel was on our board. Um, she, and we all learn a lot every election cycle, but she's really good at doing turnout um, and I think that will help. I mean, the vast majority, uh, I think more than half of our caucus are uh, Latino, uh, Latino or Latinx. 
So, you know, we will are you working with them uh, directly. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a consultant that we've hired specifically to work on Latino turnout for us um, because um, how, how important it is. So. Great. Great. Glad to hear all that. All right. Well, it is getting to be very close to five o'clock. So uh, this is the point at which we generally wind up our monthly meetings. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, Eric for coming to join us and to Kate in absentia for also coming to join us today and to Jim for battling laryngitis to update us on what's going on everywhere. And thank you to all of you, our members, for always showing up, you know, whether it's here at the meetings, whether it's when we ask for donations, for letter writing, for canvassing, you do so much and it keeps all of us as a community, I think, sane in these absolutely crazy times to know that we have this kind of community with each other. Um, so it is the end of our uh, formal meeting. We understand if folks, you know, need to roll off, go enjoy the rest of their Sunday afternoons. Feel free.